This is video history from the J. Bay Jacobs Library for the History of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And my guest this afternoon on a fine May morning in the year 1999 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is Dr. Jane Hodson from Minneapolis. Jane, thanks very much for being with us. Okay to call you, Jane. Cool. And, uh, <laughs> tell me, uh, since it's been uh, a long time we've been hoping to get a chance to interview you, uh, starting, starting at the beginning, uh, you were born and grew up where? I was born in 1915. Well, you didn't have to tell us that, but that's all right. Well, I, <laughs> I, you're, wife, you're not ashamed of it, no. No, not at all. Uh, in Crookston, Minnesota, my father was a country physician. My mother was a school teacher. Now, Crookston is up uh, north by Fargo, isn't right. it? It's up that way. Mm -hmm. And you went to school then where? Uh, I went to um, the University of Minnesota Medical School. Took my re residency training at the Mayo Clinic. Also, I took two years prior to which I had been out to in Jersey City and took my in. We had to have rotating internships in those days before we started a residency. So I <clears throat> went to Jersey City Medical Center, Mayor Haig. The, Mar Minion. the Margaret Haig Maternity yes, Center? Yes. Uh, yes, uh -huh. with, the, with um, I can't even remember the name of the physician now that the well-known well, obstetrician. I'll think of it in a minute <laughs> <laughs> as well. And you were there for, I was for, there uh, for two, years. two years. And uh, I think that the Margaret Haig Maternity Experience, I I repeated my obstetrical t rotation because I liked it so well, and, and I think uh, that probably was one thing that pushed me into the specialty. And then you, you then to the I had a right. fellowship at the Mayo Clinic already. Uh, I'd applied there before I went out to Jersey City, and it was supposedly in internal medicine. Mm -hmm. But after the, my first year in internal medicine, working on the floor with, in gynecology, uh, they suggested that it would be very nice if I'd go into, if, if I'd switch from to internal the, medicine to OBGYN because of the, they needed women so badly. That. So I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> who was the, uh, who were the chief people in obstetrics and gynecology at the Mayo Clinic when you were there? It was Dr. Muzzy. Uh -huh. Dr. Robert Muzzy, Muzzy. and, and uh, he was a wonderful man, and Dr. Randall, mm -hmm. um, Larry Randall. Larry Randall, yeah. And, uh, and Dr. Muzzy was a famous figure for uh, the, the Mayo Clinic, I think, was always more known for gynecology than for obstetrics, but he was certainly a yes, yes. well-known figure in obstetrics. And uh, Dr. Randall huh. was very, he was really the chief of gynecology. We were trying to think of Dr. Cosgrove, I bet, in yes, New thank Jersey, you very weren't we? Much. Yes, I had a senior moment there. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't remember. I remember his son too. Was mm -hmm. very active in the college. Right. We and we uh, still have the Cosgrove lecture. Yes. Named yes, after him. Yes. Dr. Now, Cosgrove was, was such. A, I remember he was so uh, concerned with his residence. Uh, I, I was complaining we, we never had any salaries in those days, you know, all we got was our room and board and uniforms. And so every time I got, and we had to wear skirts, no pants. The women did not wear <laughs> pants. And so if we got a run in the stocking, that was a major was a, calamity as far as your finances were concerned. <laughs> and when you, when you finished then your residency at the Mayo Clinic, uh, where did you go then? Uh, then it was during the war years, and I was sort of catapulted by the army, and my husband being in service down in Florida. Was your husband a physician? He was also. a surgeon. A yes, surgeon. Yes. And he was in the military. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you practice then in Florida yes, during the war years? Quite a shortage, of, uh, so they offered me a, a, a license if I if I'd uh, practice. You didn't have to even apply Plus for licensure. <laughs> And I took over in a small town for an 82-year-old physician who was the only surviving physician in this town of New Smyrna Beach, a town of about 5,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he unfortunately had a heart attack just the day before I was to start. So 
I was um, uh, all, all my, by my own. I moved into his facilities there and practiced so, for a year and a half mm -hmm. till the war was over. <laughs> It was a wonderful experience. I think everybody before they ought to do general practice. I was going to say, because you were doing general yeah. medicine, weren't you? It was, it was, mm -hmm. it was hard. <laughs> and when did you get back to Minneapolis? Not until 1947. Mm -hmm. I opened in the practice in the Lowry Building there and practiced for, up until 1972. So, now, were you in practice by yourself or with uh, others? Um, no, I was alone at first, but soon had associates. Uh, yeah. um, my husband also officed uh, with me, but he was in our practices that were quite separate. And he was doing general surgery, yeah, of general course. General uh -huh. surgery. Uh -huh. And then later he went over to the university and took a residency in heart surgery when hmm. he was about 50 years old. Oh. He was a little tired with general <laughs> surgery. And, and uh, so I was the oldest living mother of a resident. <laughs> I, I mean, wife of a resident. <laughs> well, of course, while uh, we all remember you for a long practice in Minneapolis, we also certainly remember you for your concern for women's rights and reproductive rights. Uh, tell me how you became involved in the all of the things involved in that in the in the 60s and 70s well i think being one of the few women in the twin city area i got more than my share of patients with problem pregnancies and right at the beginning they all just flocked to me i think i was in st paul the only one at the time the only woman they perhaps thought i'd be more empathetic and remember this was before uh, this was the um Back when all the states had um, laws, mm. abortion was a crime, and uh, Minnesota had a very harsh law. Four years in prison, and the, and the patient was also guilty. She was for two years for the patient mm. and four for the doctor. And so uh, it was a very harsh law, and there was no exception ex except life of the mother. So I saw all these women and the young ones and the menopausal mothers and the very sad cases that were constantly coming to me and I could do nothing to help them. And I realized finally what bad medicine it was because they would come back, in spite of my warning, they'd come back <coughs> back to see me and, and be in serious trouble and then uh, infections and so hmm. forth. By what you mean is that they'd attempted to Yes, to get an right, abortion that's somewhere. Right, and uh, this was repeated over and over and over, and I, I never recognized this. It had been something we'd been sheltered from. We mm -hmm. had no instruction in medical school, absolutely nothing. The subject was never discussed, and it was almost the same in, in, as far as the residency was concerned. Uh, uh, really, very li mm -hmm. little, not, if any. Where, where were these women procuring abortions? Oh, they were, were all they were apparently uh, from other women illegally, and uh, they were. I I never actually knew, uh, but and they wouldn't say at the time that they would come to me first, and I would warn them. No. But uh, I, I never really. I didn't want to know because the police interrogated uh, a very. Uh, it would uh, at that time they were interrogating the patients and the doctors mm -hmm. that saw them, and uh, it was uh, better, not uh, better not to know. Better not to know. That's right. What uh, what followed then? What? Well, it, uh, it there was so there was nothing that I could, we could do. I realized that uh, it it was bad medicine that we should reform the law, and so I. I spoke to the uh, medical societies, and I, I testified before the legislature. And uh, I think another thing that propelled me was the fact that I spent a lot of time going to international meetings, the fertility group. I mm -hmm. got it was interested in infertility, and I was tra traveled a lot uh, to the meetings, and I served six per terms with uh, six. Um, tours of duty with Project Hope, 
about as much as almost four years overseas, uh, and I realized in every country that I went, regardless of the laws, the accessibility of contraception and, and abortion services were uh, so important for the <laughs> welfare of women that the, their econ economy, uh, their economic level, their social level, and all was so affected by the, the uh, directly improved with their <laughs> accessibility, good reproductive <laughs> health care. What, uh, what ultimately happened in Minnesota? Did, were abortions performed before Roe v. Wade in the 1970s or no? Well, they're, they're, we did them in the hospitals, maybe on, on very special for, for cases, special cases. With consultation, mm -hmm. an, an average of about one or two hundred a year in the Twin City area. Mm -hmm. I surveyed the hospitals and found at about that time, and, and that's at least mm -hmm. the numbers they gave mm -hmm. me. And how about after Roe versus Wade and well, in the 70s? Well, in your course. in your practice. Well, in my practice was uh, um, in 1970. I uh, was was when I challenged Minnesota's law. That was three years before Roe v. Wade, and uh, the um, I realized that was New York State had just declared uh, their, uh, the law had had um, Rever legalized, in fact legalized their it. Law mm -hmm. in March of 1970. So just at that time, uh, I was decided that the only way I would give, was, had given up, I'd written a lot of editorials, and as I say, I didn't think I'd ever educate the legislature. They were hopeless. So I uh, thought the only way is a test case and um, to challenge the law. So a patient with, that had had German measles in her early pregnancy mm -hmm. came to my office, mother of three children. She seemed like a perfect candidate and she was very agreeable to, to doing it and uh, so uh, I went to federal court and asked for the, uh, them to declare the law unconstitutional which they uh, sat on for two weeks in spite of the fact that it I was, was in a hurry. Waiting too long, yes. Weeks, so yep. I had to go ahead <clears throat> and then I went back, <clears throat> excuse me, the day after and uh, uh, it, um, I, the court, the federal court said that um, I was in no, they had, would do nothing because I had been in no jeopardy. And uh, so, um, but then I got indicted immediately by the state court. So when I went back again to the federal court and they uh, said, well, it was too late. They couldn't do any, they couldn't get involved in a state case. So I was, Taken down and to, mugged and fing, fingerprinted and and uh, the date was set for trial and I I tried very hard to have an educational sort of thing uh, I got some experts from around the country um, you probably knew uh, Kushner Irving mm -hmm. Kushner who was very assistant well. secretary yes. he came to my trial and was a wonderful witness and Joe Pratt of mm -hmm. the Mayo Clinic. And uh, Dr. Chris Teets, of course, mm -hmm. everybody knew him. He was wonderful. He came out and spent quite a bit of time out there and was a real, very impressive with his beard, if you remember. <laughs> yes. And he, he uh, what, I remember the, them quizzing him as to how much he'd been paid to come out there, one of the, the lawyers. Okay. And, and uh, he said, uh, we asked him, well, why did he come when he didn't get paid? And he said, for the sake of justice. <laughs> and there was, I could just see a halo around it. <laughs> what was the upshot of the case then? The case, well, I was um, sentenced to 30 days and, um, and near probation, and the sentence was suspended pending appeal for, uh, uh, to the Minnesota Supreme Court, which I did. But the, for, the tough part of it was that they didn't hand down a decision until after Roe v. Wade. Oh, so. so I went for almost three years in limbo, so to speak, during which time I left St. Paul, Minnesota and went out to uh, head a, the clinic out in Washington, pre-term clinic. Yes. Um, 
as it turned out, that was just as well. Yeah. Time kind of running on on us, yeah. Jane. Uh, yeah, I so we're, uh, what uh, have been the battles that you fought in the intervening years? I mean, after 1973, <laughs> let's say, up till the present time. Well, there have been many. Uh, I think perhaps the one that uh, is best known is the parental notification case, the parental consent, uh, mm -hmm. Hodgson versus Minnesota that went to the Supreme Court. We didn't get it very far. We didn't win on that one at all. But it was uh, so long in the in process, we, we uh, filed it in 1981 and it, we didn't get a decision till 1990 so <laughs> say the, the mills of the gods grind slowly yes yeah. uh, and the m many of the restrictions that have been passed uh, it, it things were ne are ne never as good <coughs> they, it's, they deteriorated ever since Roe v. Wade, Wade. <laughs> well in some ways I think you're right and you you certainly were a pioneer warrior in this field for which we all remember you and uh, would you like to leave those of us who follow you with any messages about women's health care and <laughs> what attention we should be paying to it? Well I think of Roe v. Wade I always think of, of the poem Seamus Haney the Irish poet laureate who said uh, history says uh, uh, no, uh, there is no hope this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the tide of justice rises high and hope and history rhyme. In other words, and that was the Roe v. Wade decision, when hope and history rhymed. And it, it, it was, there just seemed to be a tide of justice that was so amazing to everyone that it, that it was such a... Uh, absolutely no restriction on women's reproductive choice. Well, we, we thank you for being here today, certainly, but more importantly that than that, for all that you did in your battles over the years for women's health. Jane, thanks, thanks for coming.